want to learn together a little bit about the mezuzah, halachot pertaining to mezuzah. Mezuzah is an incredibly exciting mitzvah. It's quite unusual, quite unusual in terms of uh, um, practices. When we were kids, um, we once stayed over a summer in a town in South, Lund- South England on the seaside, Margate, Margate. And we saw this house with a mezuzah. And we assumed when you see a mezuzah on the front door, you assume they're Jewish. But they weren't. They weren't Jewish. They just heard about the mezuzah and thought it was such a sweet idea. So this family put a mezuzah on their door in the middle of Margate. Anyway, what I want to do is I want to talk about there are lots of mystical ideas associated with a mezuzah. <laughs> no, but I don't think, I think in market, I think they're probably quite safe from that. Okay. You know, yes. Never, never, never underestimate the power of a uh, Stucker organization. Absolutely. Uh, Stucker. Never underestimate, uh, under, what you mean to say is never underestimate the power of Stucker, which is very good. Thank you very much, Moishala. We will indeed not do that. Now, sometimes, chas shalom, something terrible happens in a family. Um, what people often do is they check the mezuzot. So we'd like to talk about where this idea came from. And then I'd like to learn some halachot pertaining to a mezuzah. I say I personally, one of the most exciting things when I came to Israel was when you go into a shop or a bank or a post office here in Israel, they have a mezuzah on the door. In England, on the post office, there's no mezuzah on the door. So it's just, you feel like you're in a country... Even on Shari Yafo, when you enter the old city, there's a mezuzah. They're, mezuzah. they're all over the place here in a way that you would not expect to find them in other places in the world. So it's a, it's a very exciting mitzvah. So what we can do is I'd like to talk a, a, a crazy story to start with. Then I'd like to learn some halachot pertaining to a mezuzah. And then at the end, I'd like to learn a little bit of um, like the ideas behind, you know, sort of understanding the depth of why we have a mezuzah. So that's really three stages. Shalom Aleichem. How are you doing? Good. One, jo- joy and honor to see you. Okay. So look at this. These are really the questions we're going to look at. Number one. What's the basis for the mystical powers of some attribute to the mezuzah? Where's the best place to put a mezuzah? Which doorways require a mezuzah and which don't? What happens if I'm sharing with non-Jewish housemates? Do I still put a mezuzah on the front door? If you're staying in a hotel, do you need a mezuzah on the front door? Um, and really, what's what's the point? Dafka, it's a very unusual place. Mezuzah, let's say, is to, you know, inside the mezuzah, as we will see, is the Shema, in order, I suppose, to bring some sort of holiness or godliness into your home. There's so many places where I could have stuck a mezuzah. What's the significance of the fact that it's Dafka on a doorpost? Because the word mezuzah means doorpost. Yes, Yes. So you're asking, why is a doorpost on a doorpost? Because it's called a doorpost. That's excellent. No, but I would say, why is this piece of parchment put on the mezuzah of the bite? Not, why is it not called the kir or the, uh, I don't know, chalon or some other part of the house that you may have thought I, of putting I, a mezuzah? There's mystical reasons for wearing a mezuzah around one's neck. Is there? Is, I, I remember reading in that when I was studying... Um, uh, the Shabbos. Shabbos it was. Well, it, Mishra, it, it, it was uh, disgusting. What, uh, what oh, yeah, well, people would carry, that's right. Yes. The, that's right, this Yushalayim. Yeah. yeah, there was an amulet. One would, one would carry a scroll yeah. as such around, around a necklace. It's permissible to carry right. Shabbos. Now, look at this crazy story, people. When Mr. L.W., now Mr. L.W. doesn't want to give you his name because he's worried it's going to happen again. But when Mr. L.W.'s house was robbed for the second time, he decided to check his mezuzahs. The mezuzah he affixed to the front door appears below. A quick glance at it will see, will, you will see at once why it offered no protection. Can everyone see the problem with this mezuzah? Yes, 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 excellent. Do you see that? Should be Uvi Exactly, exactly. There's a letter missing there. So his house kept on robbing because that word, the gates of your house, 
was written wrongly. You follow? I just said this about 10 or 15 minutes ago. Would you believe that? That is unbelievable. I'm not surprised. Well, it's true to say unbelievable and say not surprised. That sort of doesn't make sense. You what? I said I just started studying. I'm so happy for you. (laughs) Where are you learning it? In the Shulchan Aruch? Oh, excellent. Oh, good. Hanan, that's fantastic. So, Hanan, any questions that we have, we will turn to you for your... uh... I'm only Arba Shishim and the... Okay. That's that's more Sifim than many other people are into it. That is excellent. We have a Muzusa expert here. So I'm going to go now, really three sections. First of all, the background to the Muzusa, that is the first thing we're going to do. The second thing is, we're going to do some halachot pertaining to a Muzusa. And then the third thing we're going to do is, we're going to try to talk about why Dafka a Muzusa. You follow? Meaning, if this is about God consciousness in the home, why particularly at that particular place? Is that clear? Those are the three things, but, but we're going to start with the background. Um, so we know that we need to have a mezuzah. We're told about it twice in the Torah. We're told about it once in the first paragraph of the Shema that we said just a few moments ago. And we know about it a second time from the second paragraph of the Shema. Yeah. So it appears twice in the Torah, in the first paragraph of the Shema, and then again in the second paragraph of the Shema. Which is why that mezuzah contains the first paragraph of the Shema and the second paragraph of the Shema. In other words, the mezuzah is, the, the document that is the mezuzah is um, the first two paragraphs of the Shema. So Gemara says like this, Omer Revi Elezo ben Yaakov, Kol sheyesh lo tfilin berosho, u tfilin bizro'o, betzitzit bevigdo, u mezuzo befitcho, why? So if you have your tefillin, tzitzit, and a mezuzah, you are fully um, protected. Chizuk? Yeah, yeah, exactly. That you won't sin. So No, y- yes. And I just noticed, it, where, where the typo is on the mezuzah is where it's actually talking about the mezuzah. and your gates. Yes, exactly. Yes. Yeah, the word that's missing is the word talking about yeah. is the gate that you know, keeps on gates. getting broken. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. Now, notice, according to the Gemara, according to the Gemara, it's not the, the mezuzah here is not offering protection against evil things coming to, to be full upon you, but rather protecting you from sin. I am more likely to be a good person if I have tefillin, mezuzah, and tzitzit. Not that I'm safer, but I'm going to be a more decent human being as a result of those three things. That's what the Gemara says over here. Oh, look at this. This is for Hanan over here. Kitzur Shulchan Aruch, Simon Yud Aleph. I'm afraid to say it is for you another 19 Si'ifim away. Si'if number 23. Chayav adam li zaher ma'od b'mitzvat mezuzah. It's something to be very cautious about. Mibnei she chovat hakol tamid because it is one of the very few constant mitzvah. Constant mitzvot. I'm sorry. For chos man she knos v'yitzay. Whenever you enter or exit your home, yifka b'yichud Hashem shema shel hakadosh baruch hu. You will encounter God's name. V'yiskor ahavato v'yair mishnato. He will wake up from his slumber. Anyone who observes the mitzvah of mezuzah will live a long life. Because in the second paragraph of the Shema, we're told, Put it, the mezuzah should be on the mezuzah, meaning the doorpost text should be on the doorpost. And then the next pasuk says, In order that you and your children should live long. So here it's not offering protection either, but it's got the reward straight away. If you are particular about the mitzvah mezuzah, so then you will live a long life. Mitzvah, people, is one of the very, very few always mitzvot. Thank you, Yossi. One of the few mitzvot that we are always required to. There's no, there's no moment in the day that I don't have a chiyuv to put a mezuzah on my door. 
which is why the Kitzur Shulchan Aruch regards it with such importance. There are, there are not that many mitzvot for which you could say at every moment I'm required to do that mitzvah. Okay, so that is the mezuzah. The mezuzah is the first two paragraphs of the Shema. Now I want to look at some halachot pertaining to a mezuzah. There's a very interesting debate about where you need to put a mezuzah. Is it the vertical versus the horizontal? No, we'll, no, no. Which doors? Now look at this. This is quite crazy. I wouldn't say it's quite good. It's quite interesting. The following places require a mezuzah. Do you see this? Echad sha'arei batim. So obviously the entrance to your home. Sha'arei chatzerot. The entrance to a courtyard. So that's interesting. You hear that? Not just your home. Because we said, Uchtautam al mezuzot beitecha. Uvish arecha, you should put it on the doorpost of your house. Uvish arecha means and on your gates, meaning I have a door to my house, and then you have the gates of the city. That's why all the gates of the old city have mezuzot on them. And it's not you're not entering a home. Jewish territory. Huh? The ones in the Jewish territory. Is that is that right? So the not the other ones don't have. The, yeah, they took the Arabs took them right down. Did they really? Are you serious? Yeah. In, 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 in oh, Tarshan, no. there is no mezuzah because it's to the Arab quarter. Well, that's such a sad story. Ezra, thank you for that. But uh, anyway, certainly, certainly the ones that I tend to enter do have mezuzah. Yes. David, were you going to ask a question? Yeah, no, I had, I had a question, but I think I didn't, we didn't claim to that yet. Oh, so look at this. We're going to go through a crazy list of things that require mezuzot. Do you see this? So we're saying over here, homes, courtyards, states, the ayarot, and cities. Now, a city, that's like, in the olden days, we're not talking about Manhattan. They're talking about, like, the old city of Jerusalem. Or, as I discovered yesterday when I was on a little trip, the, sta- the Yafo next to Tel Aviv was also once a walled city. In fact, the walls apparently there are older than the walls of the old city of Jerusalem, according to our tour guide. So those walls would also have a mezuzah on there. Those, uh, you know, people lived in a home. The home was in a courtyard. The courtyard was in a city. The, the entrance to each one of those require a mezuzah. Yeah, I'm, I'm a little confused. It says states or maybe, maybe not, which is... Our translation for state, but what, what, how can you put a on the state? No, 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 it doesn't mean, it means like the so cities. in the United States, every single state has, like, sometimes when you're on the highway, you're I driving like, from like one the, state to another, ah, and serious, okay. there are archways check, check. going over the highway, but where check, it says, welcome to well. blank. Every Hypothetically, if one of those states contained only Jews, you'd have to put a mezuzah. On that archway. Okay. Do you? So, I think you would have to have a complete wall, to, or like a separation that goes all the way around. Yes, see, I was in no way being serious. Yeah. yeah. And no, I heard that Medina once meant city. Huh? Medina yeah. once meant city. Yeah, I think that the truth is, as we will see in the whole of this seif of the Shulchan Aruch, um, I think you have to um, understand this this statement in the context he was writing. 400 years ago. Um, no, I mean, the city and the state is an issue, but, but I wouldn't say more than that, but what about a cow shed? Mm. Cow sheds, I've never seen a cow shed with a, with a mezuzah. I've never looked. But it's interesting he mentions it. I just want to explain what he means by that. Lul is where you keep chicken. Otsar yain v'shemen. Veita isha or veita shutafim or shared homes. Kulam chayvim. All of these things are uh, are required with a mezuzah. Now, I want to explain that I think that nowadays, not nowadays, in those days, um, a refet, a refet is a cow shed. I think in those days, have, have, any, have any of you ever been to a cow shed here in Israel? It's a quite long, quite smelly. I've been to them in America. Okay, yeah, I mean, you have these huge, huge things with well, maybe 200, 300 cows in them. The cow shed being described here, historically, we live, we should understand that we live in luxury today. In the olden days, people would have a home, and they'd have one room, which I suppose is their living room, and then they'd have another room that they would have to keep their animals in, 
because in the middle of the winter it could get cold. Not that you had like this uh, cow shed in the, you know, like a, it but it was, the, yeah, it was part of my living yeah. quarters. But it says also here that uh, only homes where Jews are living in the Koyam as well. So yeah, exactly. A cow shed, there is no Jew lives, lives there. Only yeah, the, yeah, a cow shed today would not require a mezuzah. Any room that is any room that is primary uh, use is is something which is not uh, I don't know, which is not uh, I don't know like dignified. Mm -hmm. That room doesn't is does not worthy of a mezuzah. So if you have a shower a shower room. Is, it doesn't have a mezuzah bathroom. on the bathrooms also don't have it but note sweet people that a bedroom is a place where you get dressed you get undressed in there where you schloff there a bedroom does require that is that is uh, a lot of dignified stuff goes on in a bedroom what if you had like a room which just had a bunch of dressing rooms in it yeah changing but it's not yeah changing rooms yeah changing rooms they could require a mezuzah I assuming it's big enough to require a mezuzah, and we'll come to the size later on, how big the room needs to be. But if it was a room that's big enough to require a mezuzah, then it would. It would. Store know, rooms, we'd put mezuzah. Say, say, for some reason, you are a very wealthy businessman who owns, like, uh, you know, a, a clothes store, uh -huh. and you uh, have to put mezuzah in your store, don't you? Because, um, it's on a living space. Oh, so the truth is, is a lovely question. But which you also have to put Mrs. in your workspace too. So the truth is, there is actually a big debate, which I don't think we talk about on these sheets over here. Oh, we do. Let's come. We're going to come to that in a minute about a Bet Knesset. And then from Bet Knesset, does a Bet Knesset require a mezuzah? Does the shops require a mezuzah? This, I want to talk about the home. And then we'll come to your question about shops and dressing rooms later. So I think nowadays... We live in much uh, more comfortable accommodation than the accommodation being described over here. And we, we have uh, rooms that only have one purpose. So you can have, in that time, a room where, you know, the cow, the cow shed, but it's not, couldn't, they didn't have the luxury of it being exclusively a cow shed. The cow happens to live there, which isn't so dignified, but it's still part of my home. I might store stuff there. If kids come and stay over, I might not. Sometimes I need to sneak, stick a kid or two in there to schloff as well. That I think we're talking about a, a world in which people didn't have the luxury of l these huge homes. There's a lovely trip that you should... Oh, in, it's in the Golan. You're just back from there. There's a lovely trip in the Golan. What's the uh, Katsrin? Right next to Katsrin, there is a Talmudic village. It's a village built as if it were in the time of the Talmud, and there are even Mishnayot. It, we didn't go in. It's fascinating. There are Mishnayot that you can read and understand about a house and an attic and understanding the relationship between that, how you get from a house to an attic and yeah. various laws pertaining to that in this Talmudic village. But what becomes clear when you go to this village, what becomes clear is, however terrible the dorms might be wherever you live, they are a thousand times more comfortable than anything that people were living in at the time of the Mishnah, and possibly even at the time of the Shulchan Aruch, these multi-purpose spaces, um, that nowadays we have the luxury of not required, we're not less required to do that. And therefore, even though the Shulchan Aruch might say here that if you have a cow shed, you, the cow shed requires or a, or a chicken hoop, chicken coop. coop. Oh, what are we going to do in Elul, if I can't remember the word coop? What are we going to do, Moishala? I will buy you a thesaurus. Okay, I don't think that's necessary. I don't think I'd be looking up. Just, we'll miss you, that's all you need to know. Okay, so in these these buildings, you, you, you would, they were, they were much more incorporated into your living space. And because they were incorporated into your living space, they required a mezuzah. But nowadays, I don't think, especially the smell, it's not a very dignified place there's no living going on inside a um chicken coop no living going on in a cow uh what do you call them again the cow shed? cow pen. Sh cow shed pen. okay whatever these places no there's no one no um people living in these places and it has to be a living space in order for it to acquire mezuzah 
just found out how you'll deal without Moshe. <laughs> <laughs> we'll miss him. Yes, Hanan. I guess this isn't um, as specific, but I believe I read in the Kitzur Shonah that if you have a storeroom that has an entrance <clears throat> outside of the, the building and then an entrance to your house, and the, the entrance outside of the building you only use occasionally for putting stuff in the storeroom, that you only have to put a mezuzah on the entrance to your house from the storeroom and not to that outside. But it seems here that uh, the Shulchan Aruch is like, I don't know, it's saying you need to put it on a storehouse. Oh, uh, yeah. I think the point is, I think it's, it's all to do with living space. Meaning, uh, any, any space that, that serves as part of my living space today would require a mezuzah. I think that's really the... Because, because of the verse... But what's, what's the word? Uchtavtam al mezuzah Your home and the gates of the cities. So it has to be a living space. And it has to be a dignified living space. So nowadays, a space that is not dignified, like the shower or the or the uh, loo, in those places you would be required to put. You would not. You wouldn't put mezuzah. But also places that are no longer living spaces, like uh, a cow shed or a chicken coop. Those two today would not require a mezuzah, even though at the time of the Gemara, perhaps even as late as the time of the Shulchan Aruch. Those sorts of spaces did serve some living, uh, also served as some living space. Okay, now I want to go to a shop, but I want to go to a shop via a shul. If we go to, in Seif Gimel, we read, uh, a shul is only required to have a mezuzah if somebody lives in the shul. You follow? In other words, a Bet Knesset is not a living space. And because a Bet Knesset is not a living space, therefore, a Bet Knesset doesn't need a mezuzah. But this really goes back to what we were saying earlier about different times in Jewish history. In those, in the times of the Gemara, perhaps even in the time of the Shulchan Aruch, where we, they didn't live in the luxury that we live in nowadays. And if I didn't have a space to live, the local shul, the, lo the local Bet Knesset served as a home for those people who were unable to afford accommodation elsewhere. And therefore, since people live in the shul, therefore we'll put a mezuzah on the door of the shul. But if you don't live in a shul, and in fact nowadays, most Bate Knesset, I would say almost all Bate Knesset, are not live, you know, nobody lives in the Bet Knesset. Therefore, um, you would not require a mezuzah on the door of a shul. However, for some reason, I mean, uh, maybe culturally, maybe because there always were mezuzot on the doors of Bate Knesset, we're not required, but people do put a mezuzah on the door of the shul. What's crazy, I hate to say terrible things, but there are communities in Chutzar, it's where the, the shuls have all got mezuzot, the but yeah, which is a shame because it's the other way around. It's really the home, the, the mezuzah in the home is the key. Well, but the if you've got. there to set the example. Oh, that's cute. That's cute. Now, some people make a distinction between a shul, a bet knesset, and a bet midrash. I think we may have discussed this a few weeks ago. The difference between a bet knesset and a bet midrash, we said, is like counterintuitive this little thing, but it'll make sense to you in a minute. A Bet Knesset is a place of prayer. A Bet Midrash is a place of prayer and also a place of study. Therefore, the holiness of a Bet Midrash is greater than the holiness of a Bet Knesset because there's more stuff going on there. Upstairs here is a Bet Midrash. Mm -hmm. At all times of day, there are people sitting there studying. There are, around the world, Bate Knesset, where they unlock the doors, everyone files in, they daven shacharit, close the doors, and then Mincha and Maru. The only thing that goes on in this place is Tfilah. So a place that has only Tfilah, but no Limud, is of a lower level than a Beit Midrash. The, the Gemara Megillah talks about this. I'll just get to the Mezuzah point, then we'll come to you. Um, the interesting point about that is if I have a Beit Knesset, I can upgrade a Beit Knesset to become a Beit Midrash, but I can't downgrade a Beit Midrash 
to become a Bet Knesset. Why? Because Ma'alim Bakodesh, you always strive for the holy er option. Now here's the counterintuitive thing. You are allowed to sleep and you are allowed to sleep and eat in a Bet Midrash. Which is odd, because I would think, no. It's because people are spending more time there. Oh, see, exactly. So therefore, when we go back to the mezuzah point, people, because people nod off, and people take snacks in the Beit Midrash, because they're there all day, therefore, the rationale for a mezuzah in a Beit Midrash is stronger than the rationale for a Beit Knesset. Does that make sense to you? Now, all of that, and then we'll come to you one minute, all of that is a, a background to answer your question, or maybe it was your question, about a shop. A shop. Do your parents, do, theirs, do their shop have a mezuzah yeah, on the door? Yeah. That's really interesting, because the truth is, a shop isn't a place where you live. But, because the people who work there, similar to a Beit Midrash, they eat there, and not none of the workers at your parents' shop, but sometimes the workers nod off there as well. So therefore, because you spend many, many hours there, there it becomes like a living space, and therefore um, people put the mezuzah on the door of a shop, even though it's not a living space, it's a working space, because people eat there. There's an argument, a debate, about if you would make a brocha, if you put the mezuzah on the door of a shop, but most people nowadays, even though it's not required, they do make a bracha when they put the mezuzah on the door Are of a shop. To? That's the question. That is an excellent question. Because um, if you're not allowed, to, if, you're, if, if you don't have to, then that means you're basically saying almost a shenzim in Yeah, you're quite right, Ezra. The, the, the halachics, the hal, pure, halachic purists would not make a bracha when they put the mezuzah on the, on the door of a shop. They would only make them as a bracha on a mezuzah that they put on a home, but not on anything that other than a home. But I think nowadays, sort of the mezuzah, I wonder whether people, uh, they, they do more stuff in the shop. There's more of a homely sort of, I don't know, place to be. And therefore people do make a bracha there, because you, know, you don't sleep there overnight, but you do spend all day there, and it's, it becomes like a living space. Yes. I would think that Hanan. Thank you for your patience. Um, there's very few actual big Knesset today because what's considered the, if the rabbi gives a Tvar Torah or if people just are reading or learning, doesn't that automatically make it a big midrash? Oh, that's a good question. A sermon. Purely qualify for a big Knesset is like a, a shtibble or something where there's just like minyanim, minyanim that just go on and there's nothing, there's no Tvar Torah, there's no like. Ah. Saturday mornings, or there is this like, because if there's, if you have like a big, no big Knesset, people are learning, or people, there's a debate to work. Ah, that's a good question. So they usually serve a kiddish sometimes. So I was thinking, I don't know whether, in I know where, where I grew up, we there was a big, big Bet Knesset, and that's where we used to have on the Shabbat mornings. But the Bet Knesset was only open once a week for Friday night and Shabbat morning. And all other services mean all week and also Shabbat in the afternoon. All other services took place in a smaller room next door because hundreds of people would come on Shabbat morning, but only like 10 or 15 people would come to the other services. They're not going to open this huge, huge sanctuary. And in England, it's freezing cold in the winter, you know, like heat up this huge space for 15 people. So they used to pray in a smaller room. So there are, that was quite a common model when I was a kid, I don't know to what extent it still exists. You have these big, big, fan, you know, very, very impressive uh, sanctuaries that are really only used, you know, once a week, Friday night, Shabbat morning. And Chagim. And Chagim, quite right. But no, other than the rabbi sermon, um, there, there's no, no Torah. There's that, I don't yeah. know if that would turn it into a Beit Midrash. Oh, somewhere in the sermon. Term. I don't know where it was. I was talking with Same with me. And that's what the this same. Oh. And, um, you know, uh, we, we heard people saying Marif, Marif, we ended up in Marif. So oh, we just kind of followed them. And we were we were living to this huge, huge, I don't know what it was, maybe Yeshiva. Okay. Uh, but we were living to this tiny little room to Davin. Mm -hmm. I think it was probably like that, where they have... The Shtevo. Yeah. Ah. Where, they, where they have, you know, the, on Shabbos they'll have services 
or they'll have during the week they'll have shiurim in this big room, but then they'll also have exactly, exactly, exactly. Every Fifteen minutes in the smaller rooms. Exactly, they have in the bells. Cause, the cause, yeah. bells base metrosh is is, is huge, dogs. absolutely huge. And I once went on a tour, and the reason why they don't use it sometimes some, there's something like I'm probably going to exaggerate because I don't know the numbers precisely, but just to turn on all the lights mm -hmm. and have them on for an hour in this huge, huge room. Or maybe it was before LED lights, you know, it was a whatever they had before that. Involves. Right, thank you, thank you so much. Mashallah, we're going to be stuck. Anyway, when they had those oh, yeah. bulbs, it costs a fortune. Every, every half hour of having this room lit up was a fortune. And that's why they would use these other rooms in sure, the side. Like the way how your show was set up is like quite common around a, in Seattle where I was, um, especially the Spartak show, they had a big, gigantic show where everyone went to for Shabbat, Tagim and all this, and sermons and everything and all. And they would have a small little area to just dominate and everything and all of uh -huh, uh -huh, uh -huh. Yeah. Amazing. They started opening it up. They, um, my show, they started opening up because of COVID and everything. All they want social distancing. So that's the way of social distancing was like opening it up. Clever. Yeah, this was, why was this call was way before COVID. But it's possible. Anyway, in, to answer Hanans, it is possible to have a Bet Knesset that is exclusively a Bet Knesset. Okay. Now look at this over here. Here, oh, well, in Beit in Beit Dira, there's one only Beit Knesset, so that Azara would require. Now, let's uh, one more point about who uh, has a mezuzah. A socher buy it, but is if you rent an apartment outside Israel, fadar bapundak beret Israel, or if you live in a hotel. Patur mim mezuzah shloshim yom. You exempt for the first thirty days from uh, putting on a mezuzah. Isn't that beautiful? Why? Because you can't live outside Israel. So therefore, even if I uh, if I'm there for a week or two weeks, I'm not required to put mezuzah. It's only once you've been somewhere for thirty days, then obviously. You must be here to stay. You're dwelling there. But it's only once you've gone over the 30-day time period you, that you then become required to put a mezuzah on the door. In Israel, on the other hand, that's not like that. In Israel, you are required to put a mezuzah on immediately. Do you see that? Mishum Yishuvar Israel, Because any night you live there, that's a, light in, a night in Eretz Israel. Now, what happens if you share with non-Jewish flatmates? Do you see that? If you live in a house, but you share with Oved Kochavim, with somebody who's not Jewish, you're not required to put mezuzah on the door. So, I know people have this, in England it was very common, if you studied, you stayed in halls, they used to call them halls, student halls, do you remember the halls? Do you go to college? Student halls. I visited college. Okay. So you had student halls, so you'd have like a Jewish person living in a student hall, but he wouldn't be required to put mezuzah because he was living with, with, you know, with non-Jews. You're only required to put a mezuzah on a Jewish home. But if you're living in a room with, non -Jewish, with a non-Jewish roommate, that's not a Jewish home, and therefore you wouldn't be required to put a mezuzah. I would suggest you would switch to somewhere where you are required to put a mezuzah, because it's good to be able to live in a Jewish home. Okay. Sorry, are you saying that if uh, you live with Goyim, then you really shouldn't have your, uh, you shouldn't have a mezuzah on your doorpost? Well, the truth is that the, the Shulchan Aruch talks about if you live with an Ovet Kochavim, part so of that... Worshipper of the stars. Yeah, exactly. Now that gets to a really, really complicated debate about which religions other than Judaism would be Avodat Kochavim, I mean, there seems to be, I'm really not an expert in this, but Islam seems not to be Avodat Kochavim. The uh, Muslims, like us, believe in the one God. But Christianity does not believe in one God. They believe in the Trinity. And that is Avodah Zarah. And therefore, I'm guessing that if your flatmate was a Christian, then that would be sharing with an Oved Avodah Zarah. You would not require a mezuzah. But a Muslim. It's either astrologers or astronomers. I think it's astrologers. 
or into the whole zodiac signs thing, and they so they say it, it it affects people, you know, based sure. on thing. Now they might not believe in say religion, but because they believe in this scientifically, is that close enough to avoid a zora to feed you within this? Oh, that's such a complicated question. That's part of a bigger discussion about what is our Avodaza right nowadays. But I think it's all about belief in the one God. Belief, you know, like uh, the unity of Hashem. Anything other than that is Avodazara. Okay, so we've discussed who is required. We spoke about homes require, a hotel does not require, cow sheds nowadays do not require, um, shops, Bate Knesset, Bate Midrash, don't, but they it's become the thing to do. It's uh, everyone is affixing mezuzahs onto offices, people affix mezuzahs onto um, onto shops, onto other things as well. The mezuzahs become um, very popular, and it seems as well, just I know from the um, number of ceremonies of putting on a mezuzah with prominent rabbis who have made the bracha to put a mezuzah on the door seems to indicate that nowadays the custom is to put mezuzah on a dignified space, even if it's not technically a living space, I suppose, because it's a place where people do eat, and there are, you know, facilities there as well. Um, there may not be beds there, but it's, people can do a lot of living there, other than actually sleeping, but all other aspects of life you can do comfortably in these places, and therefore they would have a mezuzah. Does that make sense? Okay, what type of door requires a mezuzah? So you need three things for a mezuzah. You need a mezuzah on the right, a mezuzah on the right, a mezuzah on the left, and you need a, what's this called? Lintel. Lintel, thank you so much, at the top. So sometimes you have just two sides, then that, that would, but, but you need two sides and a lintel. What's interesting is, you don't need to have the walls. I mean, if you've got, sometimes you have like an entrance to a courtyard, you know, that may not necessarily be with a roof. But if you've got two sides and a lintel that enter, that you enter, you know, an area through that doorway, that would be, that's a requirement for a mezuzah. So a roof is not a requirement, but the two sides and a lintel are a requirement for a mezuzah. Okay. Where do you put the mezuzah? So the mezuzah is in the airspace of the doorway, within a tefach of the outside of the room, and it should be at the bottom of the top third of the doorway, which I think this one will be. If the mezuzah is placed higher, but it shouldn't be, it should be placed more than a tefach from the top of the door frame, meaning it shouldn't be within the first, it should not be within the first tefach, that's a tefach, of the top, and it should be on the right-hand side when entering the room, not on the left-hand side. Now, that's quite complicated about the right-hand side, the left-hand side. I remember when we were kids, we used to have a patio door that led from the main room into the garden. So, do you say this door is the door that leads from the main room to the garden, in which case you should put it on the right-hand side when you're facing the garden, or do you say, no, this is the door from the garden to the main room, in which case it should be on the right-hand side when you come inside the house. That's always a very fun discussion to think about, and there are lots of factors in order to determine in a situation where, you know, obviously the front door is the entrance to the home, but when you have a door that's the entrance to the garden or the entrance to the house, which one, you want to decide which one it is. Now, in Israel, when you have a mir peset, do you put it on the entrance? But that, that's probably easier, because you can't really enter the home from outside to the mir peset. But a garden, perhaps, you could. That's always an exciting thing to think about. That is it the entrance to the outside or the entrance to the inside. And each case is decided by itself. And it's a fun halachic discussion. If any of you find yourselves in that situation, do let me know, because I love... It's, it's just one of those fun halakhi things to think about. Okay, that's where you put it. Okay. Why do you put it on the tefakh right by the door? 
so that the first thing that you do when you reach the house is you reach and touch the mezuzah. I remember at the beginning of COVID, just when the COVID was like coming into the world, one of the first things, do you remember this? The people said is don't kiss the mezuzah when you come into the house yes. because everyone's going to be kissing the mezuzah and one guy is going to pass on COVID to everybody else. And even now it's sort of, it, it's, it's such a instinctive reaction to touch the mezuzah. Oh, David, how do you I'm, feel? I'm Calm. just checking if the stream is still on. Phew! <laughs> so then when you, when you touch it, there's that, you know, that uh, reflex action. And in the beginning of COVID, people were sort of getting out of that. Okay, that is the second section. It's a very brief halachic, halachic survey concerning the laws of mezuzah. There's a lot more to say, but that's what we're going to talk about now. I want to talk a little bit about the ideas behind the mezuzah now. And I want to read to you uh, a fascinating, fascinating piece of Midrash from the book of Shemot. And then from there to lead to the Maharal. And then finally to conclude with a very, very powerful teaching from um, the Svatamit. So... The mezuzah, the word mezuzah, appears in the Torah in two contexts. The first context we discussed is the first paragraph of the Shema and the second paragraph of the Shema. The second context in which we hear about the mezuzah is Yitziat Mitzrayim, the Exodus from Egypt. Do you remember when we left Egypt, Pesach? God told uh, Moshe Rabbeinu, tell the Jewish people, to sacrifice the Korban Pesach and take the blood, and the blood was put on the doorpost, mezuzah. So, should it be, um, you know, should it protect us? Okay. Why Dafka the doorpost? Um, you know, there are lots of places where the Shema could have been, where, where we could have placed it in our house. So I want to, ah, I want to talk about, having said that the mezuzah appears twice in the uh, Torah, now I want to talk about the third time when it appears. Does anyone know the third time that the mezuzah appears in the Torah? There's a din of an Eved Ivri. Do you remember what an Eved Ivri is? A Hebrew. <laughs> Do you remember if a Hebrew slave decided 